Welcome to the Ferment Podcast, conversations about worship and transformation. This is part two of our Pastoring Worship series. Today's guest is worship pastor and immigration attorney, Tina Colon-Williams. Tina Williams, what's up? Hey, good to be here. Oh, it's so good to have you back. This is your second time on the podcast. Wow. You're a pro. I guess so. And you're one of the Ferment Originals. I was, wasn't I? Yeah, you're like episode three or something. <laughs> so it's so good to have you back. Uh, if you're listening to the pod this day, wherever you're at, uh, Tina was on way early. And if you want to hear the rest of her story, you should go back and check that because this conversation is going to be a little different today. What I would love, Tina, is I would love it if we could talk about bivocational worship leading or bivocational worship leaders. Mm -hmm. And uh, just so that everybody knows, uh, this conversation that you and I are going to have, it sits inside a month of podcasts we're doing here on The Ferment about pastoring worship. Mm. This is just, you know, trying to build a little bit of an imagination beyond just worship leading as playing my piano and singing on Sunday mornings. Right. It's all that other stuff. Right, right, right. Right. So um, here's what I'd love to do, and we'll just start here. Uh, I know a little bit of your story. I know you're you're a mom. Correct. And you're a wife, and you're a lawyer. A little bit. And you're a worship leader, and you've kind of been these things for more than a minute. Mm Mm-hmm. All of that is true. Yeah, and that's a scenario that fits a lot of people in the vineyard in the sense that most vineyard worship leaders are bivocational, you know? Um, Most people are not full-time. So I'd love if we just start here. Tell us a little bit about your life, and then what are the challenges and what are the benefits Mm -hmm. of being somebody who has a life outside of the church? Yeah. Yeah. So my life in the church has always been running parallel to— a very robust, full life outside of it. Now that's morphed over the years. I got connected to the Vineyard actually originally when I was in college. So I was a full-time student, you know, helped out a little bit at church, but mostly just went to church. And um, after graduating and choosing to stick around in New Haven, Connecticut, which is where I live, my, my sort of initiation into ministry was when I signed up, volunteered myself to be the worship pastor when the person who was doing worship at our church, Caleb Maskell, who you may know. <laughs> shout out Caleb. Shout out to Caleb. Fantastic. Uh, was moving to New York. And so there was going to be a little bit of a space. I was in between sort of things. And I said, hey, do you guys need a worship person? And the answer was like, yeah, sure, please be in charge. Okay, you're in charge. Um, and then shortly thereafter, I got married to my now husband and started law school full-time while teaching some piano to pay for some things Um, while Josh was doing, my husband Josh was doing like part-time associate pastor, part-time university, right? So he was always like full-on ministry, but juggling. Um, And I was always like, yeah, I'll do worship and study. And that sort of developed. Law school turned into professional legal Practice. practice, starting out at a corporate law firm with like 60 hour work week minimum, still on staff, volunteer, uh, no babies. Uh, Eventually the jobs shifted, but the babies came later. And now that introduced, you know, the babies to it. And so building a family life, um, being involved in ministry, not just, you know, worship leading and worship pastoring, but I was married to the guy who ended up being the pastor, right? So you got all the behind the scenes first lady, as some church traditions call it, Uh, (laughs) wife, wife, pastor's wife duties of sermon editing, (laughs) email editing, lots of editing, Um, you know, meeting up with people, marriage counseling, I don't know, like crisis management. We lived in an under-resourced neighborhood of New Haven. And so there was some like ministry to the teenagers, you know, ministry was just just in the water, Mm -hmm. right? Always alongside. And so what it is now, I got two little ones. I've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old. So a very energetic phase of life. Um, I'm still the worship pastor at the Elm City Vineyard Church. And I do work that I actually really care about, uh, immigration law, and on a part-time basis. And yeah. Okay, so talk to me about the challenges of all that. Because just even hearing you explain that, And I know this already, but hearing you re-explain that for other people who don't know, and I'm just hearing the words coming out of your mouth, I'm just going, that's a lot. (laughs) Yeah. So so what are the challenges of, you know, wanting to be a mom, but also wanting to be a professional? 
Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're someone who's leaning into their career, and yet you feel called by God. Yep. Yeah. This question of what are the challenges, what are the rewards, what's going on here, is probably the defining thread of the past decade of my life. Of what, how do I live faithfully this life when there's so much and they're not all like the same bucket, feels like. Um, and it really feels like only pretty recently I've had a few aha moments of how I'm seeing all of this and coming into this awareness of the beauty and richness of this particularly mixed up life that I've chosen to live. Yeah. Um, so on the challenges front, um, there's a lot of practical challenges and a lot of sort of internal challenges that come with that. Practical challenges is that there's only 24 hours in a day and only so many of those hours is medically recommended for you to be awake and doing things. So the practical challenges look like capacity. Yeah, my work Particularly as soon as I left law school and started like job job where people are paying you money in exchange for you doing things that they expect you to do. And like it's not just the consequence of a bad grade. Like it makes a difference if you do your job, you get paid, you don't get paid. Um, The stakes just feel high. The mental capacity is real of just I need to be on for my job. And then instead of going home to eat dinner or watch Netflix and sleep, it's like go home to like go to a worship night that I'm in charge of and then like debrief with people, like lead a home group to 11 p.m. and then go to sleep and then wake up, repeat, you know, mm-hmm. and just like lit logistics too. A lot of church stuff is in the middle of the week or like, oh, let's have a staff meeting at 10 a.m. on a Wednesday. And it's like, I can't do that because I got a whole job. And so there's a lot of sort of logistical complications of how do I even physically be present That's right. to the things that are expected of me. And so there's, you know, you burn into the mornings and you burn into the evenings and that leaves less time for you to flop around and do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So that's a cost. Yes. But I think there's an internal cost that comes with that of this sort of, and this is, this, and this is for me, I don't know if other people experience it in the same way, but I imagine it's a common thing where I have that internal metric of, am I doing a good job? Mm. So at work, it's like, it can be easy to feel like everything is in like a pie chart. Right. There's only so many hours. There's a scarcity mentality. Right. There's limited hours, limited resource. So it feels like one or the other thing can get the short end of the stick. If I give my best at work, then I'm giving if you can feel like I'm giving I'm forced to give less than my best to ministry. It's like, oh, I'm giving you the dregs of my energy. Oh, good thing. Like we have, you know, talented people and, you know, we can get it done. But it feels like there's a can feel like there was a limitation on my capacity to give my best everywhere, or at least the question in the back of my mind of, am I, am I short changing things? Am I not doing as good? Yeah, and that's the internal side. The internal narrative of, am I not, am I cutting corners, mm-hmm. right? And also the awareness of, if I had more time, I would do better. Yeah. Especially with church, right? Because yeah. I've, I've figured out a way to sort of slay at my job. I did yeah. all right at my job. But then outside of it was sort of, okay, this is more flexible. Like church is more flexible, especially when your boss is your husband. Um, You know, there's not like a kind of uh, supervision in the same way. So that I started to to wonder that have that nagging question in the back of my mind of, I know that if, if this was my job job, I would do more. Yeah. You know, like I would show up more. I would meet up more with people. I would spend more time on these things. And, and and I'd be like, I'm doing these things very last minute because I have to. I'm not responding to this person quickly because I cannot I feel like I cannot. So the awareness of the potential of my full time self and how much I'm giving that is less than the fullest of That's my right. potential. Yeah. So that kind of mindset can be a, a little bit of a constant source of oppression. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just, feel you. Am I giving my best? Am I. Am I doing a good job? I know this is not my best because it is not the most that I can give. Yeah. And because you're a leader, you just have vision for it. Exactly. Like that's the other part. You know, you're a leader. You you love church. You love Jesus. You love people. You love worship. Yeah. And, you know, leaders just have vision. That's part of what we have. Yeah. And so you're like, oh, I, I have an imagination for what this could be yeah. beyond what it is. Oh, yeah. I can see where this is going. Like, yeah. Oh, man, if I had more time, we'd be doing this. We'd be doing that. We'd be yeah. out here in the streets. We'd be like yeah. doing music over here. We'd be doing these outreaches. Yeah, I'd have, I have ideas for days Yeah, and just limited ability to, to realize everything that's in my brain. Yeah, well, I really resonated with something you said a moment ago. You were talking about, I think it was the internal struggle, which is, you know, am I doing this well enough? 
or feeling like if I give myself to my work, this is really what I resonated with. Mm -hmm. If I give myself to my job, then I'm shortchanging something else. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just deeply resonate with that because, you know, I pastor at our church in Vineyard Campbellsville. I work here with Vineyard Worship. I got kids who all play soccer. And, <laughs> and for a long time, it has felt like if I do church really well, I'm doing vineyard worship less good. Yeah. Competition. And yeah. And you just, you feel it. And, yeah. and it feels like, oh, if I'm doing a really good job of being a husband and dad, sometimes it feels like I'm letting other things go mm -hmm. that are pretty essential, mm -hmm. either at church or at vineyard worship. It's almost like mental juggling. You do some mental juggling there. Yes. Yeah. So that's real. I think that, and, and, and I think that what I, what the Lord has been working on in me is this slow and beautiful paradigm shift from this pie chart of competition for limited resources to this deeper vision of integration, where the one feeds the other rather than they're all competing for the same thing and you got to subdivide and juggle. Yeah. And almost like it feels like God's been inviting me from from this place of, oh, it's just juggling. There's limited resources. you got to focus one on the other. And honestly, so what I feel like something that changed that started this paradigm shift for me was having babies. Talk to me about that. So because babies demand. Oh my god. They don't care that you have they don't care that you have trial tomorrow. They sure don't care. They don't care that you're leading worship on Sunday. Mm-mm. Mm -mm, they do what they want. So I was pretty terrified to have babies for a little while. I was married for six years before we had kids. And and what was the fear? Well, I knew just the loss of life, the loss, the of, loss of freedom, the loss of freedom. Was I, it that? Babies or? are cool. I love babies, but I also I know a lot of moms, and I know I like. There's just a, like a, an air of exhaustion, yeah. <laughs> and it's real. And it's so, very real. and I also knew what I had signed myself up for. I was already before babies in that juggle, right? I was mm -hmm. I was pursuing this sort of justice track that demands a lot. I was trying to live like a ministry life, just in my home life, in my neighborhood, and how I show up for my husband. Been. And I was also trying to do this like worship ministry, yeah. even like outside of worship, like music stuff, yeah. you know. And so I was just like, how in the world am I going to have children? It felt like, okay, so if I'm a juggling person and I'm like balancing plates, I got three plates right now. How am I going to add a baby plate that's bigger than all the other plates? It's just going to make everything fall over. And then it will crash and I'll be a puddle of like shards of plates on the floor, right? Yeah. So it's that Jim Gaffigan joke. I don't know what that is. Yeah. He, he talks about kids. He's like, I think this joke goes something like this. He says, uh, sometimes people ask me what it's like to have five kids. And he says, it's like, imagine you're in a pool and you're drowning and somebody hands you a baby. <laughs> <laughs> Just like in the moment that in the moment that you're drowning, somebody hands you a child. Here you go. Here you go. <laughs> Do your best. Good luck. Keep yeah. alive. Yeah. So that was my fear. That in a mm -hmm. nutshell is just how if if I'm already feeling that sort of stretch with the competition for scarce resources, how can I put the most precious, vulnerable thing in my exclusive care and expect myself to continue being a whole human being? Yeah. So that was my worry, that it would be like one more thing to juggle that's more important than all the, all the other ones, so then how can I possibly do it? But what ended up happening with this shift to motherhood, to stewarding this vulnerable new life, was that instead of the family life being another ball to juggle, it became this sort of grounding center that like held together, like forced a limit upon the other things in ways that like were fruitful. For example, once I had a kid, I could not work beyond a certain hour because I had to return to care for the child. Yeah. And as soon as I'm with them, my brain is just like, with them like yeah, I can't, you, go to, you go to mommy world you can't like yeah. I'm, i can't like plan a thing and have a call and do it like i just couldn't maybe some people can't. i'm just not good at that and when so they're little no one's good no at that. let me just tell oh you God. no when they're little they just they demand they demand and demand and demand so there was this sort of this sort of slowing and grounding that happened yeah. with that shift and also just the the beginnings of a paradigm shift of like wait a minute like these kids aren't a ball i'm juggling like, they're not a plate in the air that I need to make sure not to drop. Like, these just are my, like, this just is my life. It's just in, in my life. And so, like, what if that's also what these vocations look like? What if these aren't just balls I'm juggling? It's like, oh, I got to go over here. Oh, shoot. Like, I got to go over here. I got to make sure not to disappoint anyone. But what if this just is the soil? Like, this just is the water that I'm in. And it's all one thing. So I took some time away from worship ministry for a while. I went for... I started my role as the worship 
pastor in 2010. Mm. And right up to 2020, I hadn't had much of a, any of a pause. There was a maternity leave pause. That doesn't count. Yeah. It's not a break. Yeah, you, um, you got other things happening. Yeah. And so I took three months off for maternity leave from worship, which was fantastic. And then I took another three months off for baby number two. Mm-hmm. And then my plan was come right back, keep leading worship all the time. But by that point, with the other stuff going on, one lesson of my vocational stuff that I've learned is sometimes you need to let things rest. And so take some step back. So I took a nine month sabbatical. This was because my day, my first day back from maternity leave, baby number two was like day one of lockdown for COVID. So I was now the default worship leader every single Sunday because I'm in a, I'm in a like COVID bubble with the pastor. It makes sense, right? So, yeah. You know, we can go to the church and do the little live streams. Nobody gives each other COVID, especially the early days where yeah. it's like you can't do anything. Yeah, yeah. It felt it felt more serious. Oh yeah, like we're all gonna die. So yeah. um. So we, I, it, it was like, okay, back on it, doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. And it had sort of become, back to your sort of, you're describing this mode of ferment of it's not just Sundays. Yeah. Worship ministry had been reduced to like, I'm pulling off music for a function. And then, and I was just like, ooh, mm, internal check. Like, I need to take a step back. I need to take a break. So I took a nine month sabbatical. And during that time, I'm doing this reflecting with God. Do I want to come back? Like, am I called to do this? multiple vocation thing should i just do one thing should i quit my lawyer job yeah should i should i just try to go full-time in ministry see what full-time tina pastor can do because isn't that categorically better right like my full-time energies is just better than a divide itself isn't it so i'm wrestling with all these questions in my time of sabbatical i remember one day i was in california for like another ministry thing and i took a whole half day and i'm like at the beach i'm reflecting i'm like what is the purpose of my ministry what is my life taking some time to reflect and think and and what the lord is is reminding me is something that surprised me because i was kind of expecting to be like oh yeah this bivocational thing that was a a, a placeholder right Mm -hmm. that's something you do by necessity that's something that's like oh because because logistically you need to do that but like in an ideal world you're just doing one thing right isn't that wouldn't you think like in an ideal world tina you're just a lawyer you're giving your fullest best efforts yeah. or in an ideal world you're just a minister which is like the more holy version because it's in the church right yeah. but what i felt god telling me was that no 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 i've designed you like this and i have real work for you to do in your work and there's like actual ministry there and there's a calling there and there's a pr- practical provision there and there's real work for you to do in the church and do not neglect this church this is the church this is the way I move in the world. So I got stuff for you to do, Tina. So there's a way you can show up there. So I felt this call and this challenge to step back in and show up, show up intentionally, show up differently and show up like as a pastor, but also aware of like, here's what I can do and here's what I can't do. And so let's try to chop out that little guilt voice in the back of your head that like, oh, if only you could do more. Yeah. You know? Well, I love the story you're telling right now because I think a lot of people who are bivocational, they do think this needs to be temporary. Yeah. This is this is a stage to pass through. This yeah. is this is how things start. Crucible. I, I I love that you're saying no. I took it to God, and God says, maybe this is how I made you, and maybe maybe there's something, maybe there's a way your worship leading informs your counsel work you do as a lawyer. Yeah, you know, and maybe there's something about the immigration law field that you've given yourself to that informs who you are as a worship leader. Absolutely. So during this time away from the day-to-day grind of ministry responsibilities, I was able to sort of pay attention to what, what I desired. And there was this longing in my soul of souls for integration. Just like, can I just live an integrated life? Like that, that fragmented, fractured, being pulled in different directions and having to compete just wasn't it, I'm just like, I just, isn't there more? Like, if this is really the life I'm called to, to have multiple things, like, isn't, isn't there something better than just being b- more efficient? Because the thing is, with my framework, if my framework is just there's competing demands and I have to, like, shift and juggle, yeah. then the way to do it is to just get really organized. Like, really good at, like, task management, organizations, type A, J, and that's just not my, that's not my strength. Yeah. And she's like, really, like the the next step for me is just ever increasing efficiency. I don't. I, that's just not it. Yeah, it would kill your soul. Yeah, it like would kill your spirit. Isn't there something better? Mm-hmm. So there was this longing I noticed in me for integration, for the one to inform and feed the other, and for them to be mutually effective. So anyway, I read this book 
had nothing to do with church or Jesus or ministry. It was about plants. Talk to me. This book is by this woman, and I forget her name, Robin Wall Kimmerer. I think it's called Braiding Sweetgrass. I don't know if you've heard of this book. Mm. It's like apparently becoming popular. She wrote it back in like years ago. But she's this Native American botanist. Okay. A PhD in plants. Yes. And so she writes this book, and it's just about the way that plants, that we can learn from plants. If yeah. we From traditional Native ways of relating to the land, not just the sort of Western science, I will understand well, and, it's holistic. and control. This yeah. holistic, yeah, let's listen to the land, let's pay attention and learn from the created world. Beautiful. Beautifully written. Recommend it. It's kind of long, but it's, it's beautiful. So one of the chapters is about this traditional way of planting that they call the three sisters. I guess the, the sort of American, non-Native American understanding of planting corn, beans, and squash is you just do planting by itself. Bunch of corn, like fields and fields of corn by itself, right. right? Squash mm-hmm. by itself, That's right. beans by itself. That's just like rows and rows of sameness, right? Yes. But I guess the traditional way of growing is this thing they call the three sisters, where these three plants in particular, because of how they are wired internally, they actually mutually reinforce each other. So the traditional way is to plant them all together. So you have corn pops up real tall. Then you got the beans, they like wrap around the corn. And then you have the squash that's low to the ground. And there's something about how the squash puts its roots down that accesses nitrogen that the corn uniquely can benefit from. And it's this like beautiful integrated system. Symbiosis. Right. So I read that and I'm like, that's interesting. And that's a great metaphor, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I feel the Lord in that metaphor Mm -hmm. as someone who has a couple plates. It's deep, right? Yeah. So I, and I, 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 the dots were not connecting to me when I first read this. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And at, it was at some point, it was a random moment. I dropped off my daughter at preschool and I was heading to the office to prepare for a hearing. And I'm driving in the like 10 minute drive from preschool to my office. And this image of the three sisters pops into my head. And it's just like, those are your vocations. Amen. The corn, you, you have these three and they are meant to be integrated, right? Yes. There is this like, Thing, even, and it's not like it has to be like one assigned to the other, but this idea of like, if, if my job that that sustains my, that, that is this sort of like call to justice, that's how that's how my particular role is, but you know, it could be anything, like yeah. whatever job you feel called to that sustains you, that can be this like shoot of a thing that is actually a, a scaffolding for my family to rest upon. And then this ministry that's like low to the ground, that's like the squash, is drawing up yeah. this thing that feeds the work and sustains my ability to do that work. And instead of a garden that's partitioned, and and this was another metaphor that sometimes I would think about is like, it feels like my life is messy. Like I feel like a voca- like multi-vocational person, it can be very, feel messy, right? Mm-hmm. And so I'm just like, oh, this, if, 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 if my life is a garden, I'm thinking of this like partitioned garden and like, oh man, like this like family life is, is got some weeds in. It's just kind of unruly because my house is messy because I can't clean it because I'm busy like stopping people from getting deported to their death. So it, like this, this part is messy and so I need to tend to it. Oh shoot, like when I tend to this, like, the other one gets messy and yeah. it's like partitioned garden. But this other image is so healthy and like helpful that, no, it's not this like partitioned garden you need to compete. It's one garden, one source, and this, and the roots, it's all Jesus. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that soil, it's not anything. The roots are all Jesus. And yeah. only in and through Jesus can we like live that integrated, sustained life. this. You know, Tina, it makes me also think about just the difference in the way maybe people and God organize. Yeah. Right? Like just the idea of garden. You know, if you if you go to any farm or any big big farming operation, small or big farming operation, people always plant monoculture. So like where I live, you'll see, I mean, you could see 300, 400 acre fields of corn and it's all just corn. Right. Right. Or and like my father, he always grows a garden. He and just just the way you described, there's the corn over here, mm-hmm. the cucumbers are here, the squash mm-hmm. are here, the beans are here, the onions are here. 
you know, and they're all kind of like subdivided, but it's like, it's monoculture. Yeah. But if you look at nature, it's polyculture. Yeah. Like if you think about a forest, everything's in there together. Yeah. And there's some kind of a system that is keeping it alive. Yes. Yeah. I, I love that. Three sisters. It's, it's, it's great. It's just a helpful little metaphor for me. <clears throat> and also reminds me that like, kind of like what you're saying, what shows up in nature is just this reminder that we serve a wild God. That's right. Right? Like a, an unruly. That's order to him. Unkempt God. Like we serve a God that is just, he is unconcerned with the kind of neatness that yeah. empire concerns itself with. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he's free from imp- from that sort of like yeah. order. Everything is like in, in line with itself. What he's concerned with is life. That's right. So it's just a helpful thing to grab hold of. Is like, is my metric order? Is my metric efficiency or is it life? Because yeah. if it's life, then my Lord, there is life in this ministry. Even if I'm giving this much That's of right. my time, if I'm giving it wholeheartedly, there is life sprouting up. So let's go. Let's keep yeah. doing that. In this work, there is life being sustained from it. Yeah. Right? I and maybe that. it's messy and maybe it's entangled, but it is life and that pleases that pleases the Lord. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that's helped me, I mean, I, I'm not classically bivocational, but I, I I do resonate with this in the sense that I do have multiple jobs For that, sure. that are important and that I feel called to. Yeah. Right. And, and one of the things that's been helpful for me is to think about um, the year or even a month in terms of like seasons. Yeah. And, and this has been very helpful to me to go, okay, this next season or this next horizon uh, this is a church season, and yeah. I'm going to just give everything I have to the church, you know? I'm going to say no to as much vineyard worship travel as I can, and I'm really going to dig in and, like, grow my teams, build my leaders, sink my roots down into friendship, just yeah. just being with people, uh, try to preach better, do ministry. And then, you know what, I look up on the counter and go, you know— okay, we got a bunch of vineyard worship stuff to do. Mm-hmm. And I need to go to California and I need to go to Nashville and I need to do this. And this next little season, I'm just going to give myself permission to be like hardcore vineyard worship guy. That's good. And and the church will, it's going to live, it's going to live and move and have its being and all of that. And then, you know, in the fall, especially the fall, uh, when all the kids are playing soccer, I try to just like really dial back my responsibilities at church and some of my responsibilities at Vineyard Worship so that I can just be ultra dad. And I want to go to every single soccer game, hmm. you know, doesn't awesome. always work. But I, but this idea of seasons has been helpful uh, to me to go, you know, I can make a good run at this. Let me run hard in this direction for two weeks. OK, now I'm going to run hard in this direction for two weeks. Now I'm going to run hard in this direction for two weeks. And that's been a lot, uh, a lot more freeing for me. That's helpful. You know? Yeah. That's really helpful. Just I think the agricultural metaphor is just, I don't know anything about it, but it's so helpful, right? Because it is. the idea of seasons and even like the metaphors from scripture that about um, abiding the vine and then the Lord pruning the branches that are bearing fruit. Well, so if there's certain seasons where some things are sprouting up and they need to be tended in a special way. Yeah. Let there be grace for that. Well, I mean, you mentioned John chapter 15 there. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. Jesus says, if the vine produces fruit, it gets pruned. Uh, what's interesting is, uh, is he says this, if the vine doesn't produce fruit, it also gets pruned. The truth is, everybody's going to get pruned, right? Every, <laughs> pruning's coming. The pruning's coming. But yeah, no, there's, there are seasons to things. And, and, you know, there's just some wisdom even in the Old Testament about, you know, every seven years, you should just let the field lay fallow. Yes. You should, you should just, uh, winter is a gift. Right. I mean, I, the Lord talked to me about that a few years ago. Like, winter is actually a gift. Right. It's a gift to the, to the land. And I was feeling... Um, when I received this little word, I was feeling like, oh, Adam, you need, you need to be, you know, writing more music and leaning into your artist side. And I, I just felt like I was hitting a wall. I, I remember I was like in my office one day and I just sort of said out loud, kind of to God, I don't know. I just said, this is winter. And it was almost as soon as I said winter, I heard a voice inside of me say, and winter is a gift. Ooh, and I was like, oh, that's good. Yeah, you know, that's right. I don't have to be all things all the time. That's I can I, like just like you you did that thing of like letting worship go for nine months mm-hmm. and then coming back, you know. Because here's the truth, Tina: if anyone in the world is called to lead worship and sing, it is you. Like it is just so true. And if you were to lay it down for nine months, it doesn't change it mm-hmm. because it's just who you are. It'll never. It'll if you 
it will never not be true because it's who you are. Yeah. And, and in my own life, that's part of what I've been waking up to. Like I'm called to lead and I'm called to preach. And if I do that a lot or if I don't do that very much, it doesn't change it because this is who I am. I love that. This is, so we can give ourselves a little grace and go, where's the wind blowing? I love that. Yeah, I've become a big believer in Sabbath and sabbatical. And I also just want to name the reality that in, in some of us are in a bivocational space where we are our own bosses everywhere. That's nice. <laughs> That's nice, right? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, I can just put this to the side because I'm prioritizing the other things because I'm in charge of myself. Correct. But uh, most, most humans in that sort of space of juggling, they're not in charge of their own schedule in that yeah, same way. Yeah, most Bible people are not. Right. So it's just in, um, so I just want to name that, that it can feel like, okay, well, that's nice. That'd be really nice to just like mm -hmm. put that on pause while yep. I focus on church. But I have to show up at work at these specific times yep. because otherwise I don't have a work to show up at, right? Yep. So, but I don't, I, what I, I do think that this calling is no different. So I, I think there's a way that, that those principles of seizing hold of winter taking that rest to put things aside when you can, even in micro versions, does real good work. Yeah. So I've become a believer in Sabbath, like weekly Sabbath. Do you have a Sabbath practice? Saturdays. You, yeah. I do know where I don't check my email. I, I mean, sometimes people call, and sometimes, but I try to like put it aside and mm -hmm. I'm not doing work. I'm not expecting myself to do work. I'm not expecting myself to be responsive to work, um, ministry or paid. Yeah. Um, and so I think that most people, like, there is a space you can carve. You know, I think some sometimes I, I know folks who are just in that mentality of, like, I must constantly grind. You don't understand my life. I don't have an option not to ceaselessly grind. And it's just like, well, you might need to think some things through because you can't. Yeah, you're going to die. You're going <laughs> to die. Yeah. And you can't. And the Lord will provide. Like, find another job. I'm sorry. Like, there is a way. Yes. There is a way to insert Sabbath into your life, yeah. whether that's a 24 hour Sabbath every single Saturday, whether that's seasons of like you take that vacation seriously and you rest, yeah. whether that's like if, if it's a morning, like what you can start small, yeah. but that inserting that winter, inserting that ceasing mm -hmm. is necessary so that one thing, especially if it's like, oh, this is my paid employment. I must by necessity, economic necessity, ceaselessly grind like that. That's a that's a red flag for me. It's and it's unsustainable, especially if you feel called to more than one thing. I don't think it's unsustainable if you're just doing only one thing. Yeah. Um, no, but that's that's the, in many ways, that's the voice of American Empire, isn't it? Yes. Rise and grind. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. We've just we and and a lot of times we don't even know that that's we don't even know that that's the controlling narrative that's ruling our life because we just we're so it's, it's the water we swim in. The water. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I agree. Yeah. Talk to me about your Sabbath again a, a little bit. You're, you're not going to check email and you're trying to let go of like ministry and, and paid work stuff. Do you do anything that's fun? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Some book somewhere somebody read and told me about is, uh, that the, the, a good Sabbath has pause, pray, and play. Oh, okay. Three I like P's. that. Pause, like pray, and play. Um, I like that. So if it's all play and then no pray, then it's not like a Sabbathy. If it's all like intense prayer, but you're not doing anything to just like exist and like relax, then that's also maybe not the point. So just like a sim the simplicity of pausing. So like I try to avoid a Sabbath where it's like, you get up really early. We're going to a trampoline park with the kids and then we're going to go to like, yeah. and ceaselessly having fun is also tiring. Yeah. Um, so some element of pausing, some element of just being with the Lord, even if it's a short walk and the part you know by myself and then some element of like fun so it's not like i become a monk and shut myself away I, and yep. people have different personalities i'm an extrovert so yeah my sabbaths can be very extra you want to do things yeah yeah okay hey let's do uh, let's take a shift here and let's just do some granular stuff here okay talk to me about how maybe worship leaders might help and bless their working volunteers you know because like our worship teams they're filled with people who are mostly volunteers they like have their own jobs they have their own families and, oh yeah and uh, Ted and I, we were talking the other day about how, how much like a good worship community is like, it's a big cost to them. Mm -hmm. Like to do it well, it actually requires a lot. And in the in the way that maybe being on the hospitality team making coffee, yeah, as good we need that too. Yeah, but it, it's not the same investment. Yeah, yeah. So talk to me just about blessing volunteers who have a life and children and 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 a job. Yeah. Speaking as a working volunteer, I think that the smallest check-ins can go a long way. Yeah. You know, I think there's a way, especially if your working volunteers are talented, you can take their 
excellence as evidence of their ease. Doing yeah. It, right? Yeah, like, they do it so well, everything's good now. Exactly. Life. Just this idea of, oh, it's easy for you. This is easy for you. You're good at it, right? Yeah. Like, oh, this drummer who's fantastic. Like, they come and they drum. She's like, this is easy for you because you're so good. It just leaks so out Everything is great in their life. Yeah. Like, this must be easy for you. And I think sometimes as musical people or, or in any volunteer role, like, oh. But I think especially, like, something that has, like, a music, like a musical talent, a talent aspect to it. Like, setting up chairs, like, everybody knows that's not, like, f- categorically fun. Yep. But music is fun. Singing is fun. She's like, oh, you know, can you just come and do this thing real quick with, like, no notice? It's easy for you because yeah. you're good at it. Yep. And you don't realize the person's life in context that each small yes, that maybe even if it is an easy yes in the moment, they are cumulative and they're up against other things that are going on in their lives. So beware, be attentive to the fact that people's yeses cost them something. And unlike a full-time paid ministry person, we're like, you've already paid them for that yes. You've paid them to set aside the time to give you that yes. Mm-hmm. Volunteers, like you, you're asking that of them and it comes at a cost that, that is felt in yeah. a different way. So I think attentiveness to the cost of the yeses, even if they feel easy and not to mistake excellence for ease. I love that. That's really wisdom. That's um, pastoral wisdom. And I think that, and that check-in of just like, hey, how are you? Hey, how are you doing? Are you feeling okay? You know, the, the fact of being asked is felt as compared to the fact of not being asked. Because I think I've been in seasons of both where people check in, you know, and then I've also been in seasons where nobody even checks to see how things are going. As long as you get the stuff done, we think, we assume you're all set. That's right. But they don't give any feedback of like, are you doing it well? Are you doing it poorly? Like, how are you feeling about how you're doing? So even just simple touch points of how are you doing? How do you feel about what you're doing? Because I think what I was describing before is there's a silent narrative. Am I doing, I don't know if I'm doing well, right? Like when you have, when you work for a church, presumably you have systems of sort of checks and balances and supervision in place. You go to a staff meeting, you get feedback, Hey, you did good on this, but next time do this thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of the sort of people who are volunteering bits of their time, they don't get that. They don't have time for that. They don't have access to that. So the leaders have to go out of their way to follow up, yeah. give that feedback. Even if the feedback is, hey, thank you. Hey, you did a great job with that. I appreciate that. That can fuel things more than you realize. No, and the, the absence of saying that, you cannot assume that they know that. That's right. Yeah, that's real pastoral wisdom. Okay, similarly, you mentioned this in one of your opening salvos when we just started this conversation. Talk to me about how pastors can make bivocational like worship leaders or bivocational leaders effective and a healthy part of the leadership team. Because you were talking about a, a moment ago, I can't do a 10 o'clock on Wednesday staff meeting. I've, I'm, I've got lawyer stuff to do. So, mm-hmm. so talk to me, how do we manage your bivocationalness with feeling like you're actually a part of the team? Honestly, full. Just, I'm figuring that out. Yeah. Still figuring that out. I do believe it requires quite a bit of flexibility. Yeah. Because I've had seasons and stretches. Uh, pre-kids, I was more able to just bend. But then it depends on the context. So I was in a work, I've been in a work context now where I get to set my schedule. So I'm free every Friday. And so I would go to pastoral staff meetings every single Friday because I was home, because I, my job allowed me to. That's right. But I've been in other contexts where, like, I work at a firm where there's, they, you bill every six minutes of your time towards no. a, every six minutes. You categorize it and you bill it. And they track, you haven't shown enough FaceTime in the office. Like, I can't just be like, sorry, I'm going to peace out for two hours for a staff meeting for church. Yeah. That is not billable time. Yeah. So it depends on the context. So in that context, we... Yeah, tra- we're, sending that, we're sending that bill for 120 <laughs> minutes to the church, <laughs> Tina. <laughs> You can't yeah. afford it. Um, <laughs> so the, um, the during those seasons, we tried out some things, but also like within reason, you got to be within reason, right? So there mm-hmm. was a stretch for almost a year where we moved our church staff meetings to 7 a.m. Whoa. On Tuesday morning so that I could, so I could go and yeah. I could show up at work. Did I enjoy that? No. Do I recommend that? No. I A for effort. Great trying to include me, but like yeah. sometimes you just got to reduce the expectation. Yeah. Right? Like that, that That was a good effort at flexibility, but not sustainable at like my brain yeah. functioning yeah. Uh, at the end of the day. That's right. Well, you know what? One of the things we found too is sometimes when, because we have a couple of people on our staff who are uh, very bivocational. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes when we have a meeting and maybe they're just like not able to come to staff for a while or something. Sometimes we'll just have a real quick check-in right after church. Yep. 
hey, let's let's pop into my office and let's just let's just everybody okay? Mm-hmm. What's happening? You good? Mm-hmm. You have everything you need. What do you need from you know that kind of a thing? Uh, because we're already going to be at church. Yeah. And so sometimes we can just pull that back. That's beautiful. And that's what I mean by flexibility. It's like not just flexibility in terms of the time of day that you meet, Mm -hmm. which obviously is practically necessary if you have a whole other job, but flexibility in terms of the substance of what are you doing? Like, does that person who's sort of juggling things, do they have to be present for the two and a half hour meeting where you're talking about every logistic of the? No, right? No, it's it's just silly. We don't need it. Just let them have a short one, you know? So that kind of like, what's a way that we can help them feel included? Maybe like once a month for the last 30 minutes minutes of this meeting, we're going to invite them to come and give an update and share what pray for them, right? right? Like, just be creative. I love that. Okay. Granular here again. This is very much into your context. Just talk to us about traveling and being a mom. <laughs> I mean, we're, you and I are in Colorado <laughs> right now and uh, your children are not here. Neither are your husband. And it's great. Yeah. And you're having a great time. I'm living my best life. I know you're living your best life. <laughs> talk, just talk to me about that because you know, you and Josh, you do some traveling. Oh, yeah. And you got your kids. Mm-hmm. And they don't disappear when you get on the plane. So talk, talk to me. What, what is, what's your headspace? Well, I only have experience as a mom up to the max of age of four. Yes. So I'm sure there's different realities I have yet to live into. What I know is traveling a bunch with tiny babies. And my experience uh, to date, and we don't have grandparents or family, any biological family who live anywhere within a 10-hour drive of us. Whoa. So ideally, like my advice would be like live by your parents, have your parents like in your life and pray that they are kind to you and like, you know, give them your children. Ideally, right. Ideally, that's how it works. Obviously, that's not how it works in real life. But I've seen some grandparents with you. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, oh, so yeah, yeah. I, that's, I'm, that's so, what I'm talking about. Talk to me about that. I think this is actually very cool. Right. So I, I think I think that, again, like the default, like really easy, like, you know, like the grandparents. Are, yeah. But um, what we have to do is be creative. And we are in a – and I understand that like sometimes – Part of what I'm trying to say is, like, not everyone has the same deck of cards to play with, right? right? And there's certain kinds of, like, privilege that allow you to have somebody be able to afford a flight to fly to join you and help you care for your kids, right? So I'm just, this is not, not Mm -hmm. all, not all resources are equally accessible. So you just got to, you got to be creative and figure it out. So most of those early life of baby flights, we just brought our kids to everything. (laughs) Yeah. Like, we brought our babies to everything. And early on, um, sometimes we just would bring them, they would just be with us. And so we'd be at, like, National Vineyard Executive Team Board meetings. And it's all grown people and a three-month-old baby who is... I loved it. ...actively attached to my breast while we were discussing things. I thought that was great, though. (laughs) I I love that you guys were just like, we're putting the babies on our hips and we're going. Mm Mm-hmm. Putting the babies on our hips on the table like I'm, I'm listening attentively at a conference room uh, yeah. while I am like with one arm back and forth back and forth rock, rocking a little stroller with a sound machine on and yeah. and sometimes they the baby freaks out and I leave and I come back right so it is a little bit messier but I think that one thing I've I've learned to adapt with with babies is it's kind of another like broader lesson of like the bivocational kind of multivocational life is just to be very comfortable with a certain degree of messiness Mm -hmm. and so like i for me to be fully present here you get to you get to join me in this aspect of my family you get to have my baby here as well you're welcome and unapologetically like bring it on because you sometimes you don't have an alternative well and i've and i've also just noticed i've noticed you and josh i've noticed you and josh just switch out oh yeah you guys will just switch out and then 30 minutes later, you come back in and josh is gone (laughs) but i i love it because it's just it's it's just Man, it's just the flexibility it takes when the kids are small. Yeah. But you're still present. Yeah. And then they would go to sleep and then we would hang out at night. Yeah. You know, you have your little baby monitor and they're snoozing. and iPhone thing. (laughs) We have the little iPhone thing and then... We drink a wine together. You know, that's very cool. I I, I just, I wanted to, I wanted to highlight that because... Because it is possible to do yeah. the things you're called to do, even if you have some little kids. And and oh, yes, yeah. it's really hard and no, it's not simple. But, but honest, I've been to, impressed. To be honest, it's fun. And I and I know, I mean, everyone has different experience. Everybody's kids different, different temperaments. Like I'm lucky with babies that like can hang with the group. But I think they've been trained from an early age to like hang yeah. with loud things and late nights. <laughs> it's honestly been really fun. But that partnership is is crucial. I think yeah. that we maybe are at atypical marriage. Uh, sometimes in like Christian circles, we're like, you know, like one person takes the lead ministry. The other one is just like the stay at home, like help. Some, and that has happened in different sort of ways. But a lot of times, since we're both in ministry, 
And we're both sort of called to the forefront in different ways. Yeah. Um, at the home front and, like, outside of our, our yeah. home context, we do have to trade off a lot. Like, especially early, like, pandemic where there wasn't tons of other staff doing things. It was like, Josh, you're preaching. Not seen as leading worship. But, like, no one can care for your kids because it's COVID and they're not allowed. So it'd be like, okay, I'm, I'm leading worship and Josh is standing right there, like, holding the babies, entertaining them with the Disney show. And then as soon as I'm done singing, he's like, okay, quick, trade off. And then, like, I'll pass yeah. the baby and then I'll walk. And then it's just literally handoff tag like a relay race. Like we yeah. just passed the babies. Well, my experience of you guys as you've raised little kids is that you guys really do, you, you're a team. Yeah. You're yeah a we, team. Have to, we have to be. Yeah. No, we it's great. Okay. Last, last granular question here. Um, what would you want to say to vineyard worship leaders who are bivocational? They haven't been to a vineyard worship event. Mm. They literally maybe can't come mm -hmm. or maybe they get two weeks of vacation. It's costly. Yeah. And, but they want to connect in some way. So just riff, riff here, you know, is, is there something that we can say to people who are less connected and, man, we just want to get connected? I think that it's worth the cost. Yeah. If you can make a way, mm -hmm. it is worth the cost. I first connected to Vineyard Worship retreats and that yeah. sort of thing when I was in law school. Now that's a lucky time because law, like school is just more flexible than, than job. That's right. But law school is kind of intense. Like to take a whole week and miss a whole bunch of classes, like right before exams is not an easy thing. Yeah. I remember going back and forth. I'm like, do I do this? Like, do I, I don't know. Like maybe this is just for people who like only do this. Right. And almost disqualified myself a hundred times, but going to those spaces where you're connecting with other worship leaders, it just was like, water to my soul yeah. <laughs> because it's just this, I think this is true for people in ministry who, for whom ministry is not your job job and your colleagues aren't also doing this. And That's like, right. your colleagues at work m in most job places are not also like, oh yeah, I totally get that. Like, leading ministry and like church and Jesus, like that's just not their world. So, and then you don't have that sort of colleague experience in ministry because you're not able to go to the staff meetings. You're not able to be really mm. like fully a part mm. of the thing. So you're kind of alone in mm. both worlds a little bit mm. more than somebody who's like, I got my whole like staff team ministry yeah, that's crew, right? So you, I think us, we are more at risk of being floaters alone and carrying the weight of ministry and like family life and all this stuff like, alone because there aren't built-in infrastructures to care for your whole self right the supervisory structures at work aren't caring about how you're doing a worship ministry your supervisory things at worship ministry don't know what your day-to-day -day job is like that's right so to go hunt out community in the ministry space uh that that is connected to those back to the plant metaphor that people who are deeply connected to those Jesus roots yeah. and get the unique weight of leadership mm -hmm. to like just listen to you and pray for you and carry you. I remember those. I went to every single vineyard worship retreat after that. Yeah. First one. That's where I met you. Uh, yeah, it's true. It's mm -hmm. true. I remember. Mm -hmm. But every single one, they like to be in spaces with other, not just church members, because you go to church, right? Like, yeah. you, So people can pray for you, I guess, but you're a leader, so it's different. Like to be with other leaders in church who pray for you. I remember all those worship retreats. I brought my bivocational baggage to to those. And I'm like, pray for me. I feel split. Pray for me. Like, this is what I'm discerning vocation wise. Pray for me. I don't know what to do. And then to have other worship ministers pray for me and my sort of like the logistics of my juggle, the, the vocational discernment stuff, like was such a blessing and a sustenance. And so it's just like, seek it out, right? Yeah. Go to the retreats if you can. More and more, you guys are trying to do those like sing together weekends and yeah. things that are more accessible to people. who. Yeah, work. we've been experimenting with that. Some of it just because we didn't know that we could pull off a big mm -hmm. retreat wow. during the pandemic. But part of the like impulse with the little sing together weekend is just trying to make room yep. for bivocational people. Do that. Show up Friday night, Saturday morning. Yep. Oh, we want to worship together and we want to pray for you. I mean, that's it's literally that simple. Exactly. So awesome. I'd say if that exists, do that. <laughs> yeah, the, those those are going to keep on existing. Beautiful. So yeah, amen. Tina, thank you for sharing your story with us. No problem. And thank you for giving us the wisdom of the three sisters. I think people will remember that. And that feels like a word for God for us. Might be. Yeah, it might be. All right, everybody. Peace.
Hey everyone, Casey Corum here, producer of the podcast. Thanks for listening. As always, if you've been enjoying the podcast, here's a few ways you can help us. First of all, leave us a review on the podcast platform of your choice. This helps more people find us. Also connect with us on social media, Instagram at the Ferment Podcast and Twitter at Fermentcast. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Peace. Peace.